Today's scripture reading will be from John 8, 12 through 20. Again, uh, it's uh, John 8, <laughs> verses 12 through 20. <clears throat> Again, jo- uh, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the, te- in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Father, we praise you for your word. We thank you for this morning that we can gather and open it together. I thank you that we can praise the name of our Messiah, our Lord, the Christ. I thank you that we grasp by your grace, that you are the light of the world. That we grasp that freedom is found in the reality of who you are and the truth that you bring. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to understand your word. I pray that you would build us up and that we together would bless your most holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. (laughs) Amen. That's awesome. title for the sermon this morning is Debating Pharisees. Arguing with religious leaders appears much the same as with modern liberal theologians who fashion Christ according to empty deceit, according to human tradition, and not according to Christ. A few years back, a lot of years back, I wrote this paper and I used a word in it, liberal. And I used it over and over and over and over and over again. And when I got my paper back, it looked like it had been dipped underneath an animal being crucified or killed or something. It just was this big red mess. Because I used this word in about six different manners. And it was very difficult when you read it. I understand this now. It was very difficult when you read the paper that I wrote to understand what I meant by the word liberal. Because in one sense, the phrase actually means generous and open. I would like to be known as liberal. And everybody in this room was like, (gasps) don't say that. Because what do we automatically think then also that goes with liberal? It's partisan politics. It's, It's red and blue. And we fail to understand that the word has varied use over time and in different places. And, you know... If you're talking about gravy, put it on there liberally, baby. If you're talking about politics, you might want to hold that gravy, right? The fact is, is that we don't often draw intelligible lines between these words to our own hurt, to our own misunderstandings, if you will. So I'm going to use a word this morning, and I'm going to try to help you understand it, and it's the liberal theologian. Now, the liberal theologian might look at me and call me a liberal. Confusing, huh? Why? Because I haven't tucked my shirt in, because I'm wearing jeans, right? Because I don't have the business haircut, because I haven't shaved my face. Many a conservative liberal theologian will criticize me by the way I dress or by the way I listen to certain kinds of music. 
can't be singing them praise songs now. It's hymns only, right? I would be labeled as liberal by the fact that we have a guitar on stage, the devil's instrument, right? And drums. I mean, it's weird the things that we label as liberal and conservative. You can be culturally liberal and, you know, theologically conservative. And so when I think about the liberal theologian, I want to define it very particular for you. This is not a good thing. The liberal theologian is not a good thing. The liberal theologian is, in all honesty, the Pharisee. The one who comes to the Word and tries to make the Word say what they want the Word to say. The liberal theologian oftentimes likes to claim Christ, and yet at the same time they reject who Christ says He is. They like to define Him according to their own precepts and principles, and you at times ask, have you ever read? Much like Christ asked the religious leaders of His day, have you not read what the Bible actually says? And you might have some liberal theologians be like, yeah, well, that's not the red letter stuff. No, especially the red letter stuff. Have you read what Jesus actually said? And here's the thing is most liberal theologians, they haven't put enough time into what Jesus said because they don't value the word of God. They don't value it as the Word of God. They like the religious document. They like the the historical recording thereof, but they don't actually believe what it says. Here's one of the reasons I'm not a liberal theologian. Because I can't handle reading the Word of God and it being twisted. What I mean by that is it either says what it says and we're going to do it, or it doesn't, and let's burn it down. Because if that's not true, watch out, baby, I'm taking over Thermopolis tomorrow, and you guys know me well enough to this. probably true. If I have nothing restraining me regarding the truth of the cross and, and Jesus and the redemption that He brings, and there's nothing but death and, and then blackness thereafter, if there's no gift of life, then what are we waiting for? It's only pain after this. Let's get why the getting's good. Some of you are like, yeah, let's take it over tomorrow. No, no, no. I actually believe what the Bible says. I actually believe what the Word of God says. I actually believe in the redemption that Christ Jesus brings. I actually believe that He is the authority, that He is the power, that He is the one, that He is who He says He is. It's, it's abysmal if He is not who He says He is. We're in trouble. and We're just playing a big game here. And that's the thing, is the liberal theologian likes to come up and say, well, it's more the idea that's important. It's more the the conceptions of what Christ is bringing. It's not so much important that he was born of a virgin. It's not so important whether he was a genuine historical character that raised from the grave. It's the the ideological concept that he raised from the grave, really, that we're holding on to. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. Let me tell you this. It absolutely matters whether it's true or not. Absolutely, 100%. And it is absolutely important that we say who Jesus says He is. That we do not misrepresent Him or fashion Him in our own likeness. That's one of the biggest problems with any religion, even if they have cultural conservatism marking them with liberal theological underpinnings, what ends up happening is we fashion a Jesus in our own image. We like the best parts of Him that we think need to be extenuated and brought out and held out front. We like to define love in our own terms rather than in His terms. We like to define redemption according to our own religious tradition, philosophy, empty deceit and elemental principles of the world, and not according to Christ. That is the basic of the liberal theological tact. When you think of the Pharisee, we often think of stodgy, conservative kind of people, right? Rigid and hard, but these are the liberal theologians that I'm talking about. In the day of Jesus, these were the ones that liked to define things according to their own traditions their own precepts, their own principles. And when Jesus came to them, He challenged them. He challenged them in kind of a mean way. 
You see, one of the things that the modern liberal theologian likes to do is they like to label what love is and is not. And here, Jesus, according to the modern liberal theologian, would not be regarded as loving. He multiple times says, your father's the devil. Pretty harsh. And he also told them, you don't know the father. The father that they claimed to have a corner on the market for, he's like, you don't know him. The reason that I chose to go this entire long section of Scripture is not because I really want to preach five sermons in one. It's because I want you to see the whole argument. I want to have you see the whole argument of Jesus with the Pharisees. And so there are going to be some things that I skip over. I apologize for that. But we really could have five sermons just in what we're going to go through today. I will try to limit it, I promise. Kind of. Kind of. Basically, the flow of the argument is going to be Jesus comes in and he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world, and as I am the light of the world, I am sent by the Father, and you don't know that Father. And their response to him was, yeah, we still can't arrest him. Mainly because this time had not yet come, as we talked about last week, but also because nobody had ever spoke like him before, and they were taken back by the authority with which he expressed. The next one is, unless you believe that I am the light of the world, unless you believe that I am sent from the Father, you will die in your sin. Unless you believe that Jesus is who Jesus says he is, there is no redemption, there is no gospel for you. It is only bad news. And there's going to be a time in which you know that Jesus is the Christ. When you put him up on that tree, you will know that he is that. But if you don't believe in him, you're going to perish. At that point, many people believed. Jesus was talking about six months prior to his uh, crucifixion and resurrection and all that. And as he's talking, he's at the end of the Feast of Booths and, and right around in that period and time frame of his life. And many people believed in response. And so he says the ever true statement that our culture loves, if you, know, you believe this truth, the truth will set you free. Now, it's a definite article before it the truth not a truth not any truth not just general truth you know generally speaking but the truth and reality of christ and who he is and what he has done and the purpose for which he came if you believe that that truth will set you free well as he says that he says but you're not going to get set free because you're children of satan again gets kind of rough and then he goes on to, I tell you these things, and because I tell you this truth, with you claiming to be children of Abraham, but you're really being children of the devil, you don't believe because I'm telling you the truth. Because of their own arrogance and their own presumption that they've got it figured out. So they try to pull some of the same maneuvers on him, give him a little bit of an ad hominem attack. Attack him personally. Attack him in the rumors of his mother. Yeah, well, at least we're not bastards, essentially. At least we know who our dad is. We don't know who your father is. Well, he's not terribly impressed. He cuts him again, saying, if you were Abraham's children, you would believe me. And I'm in this, and I'm not seeking my own glory, but I'm seeking the glory of the one who sent me, because, and he says a crusher here, he says, because I am. Now, you may not see that as a crusher, but to the Jewish ear, here's a people that couldn't pull the trigger until this point. They couldn't arrest him. They, they couldn't grab him and pull him in. They, they were struck by his authority. And what he did is he spoke what God spoke at the burning bush where he says, I am that I am. It is the verb of just existence. No more place in all of Scripture is clear, more clear than right here, that Jesus says, I am the Father. I am God. Deity is mine. And what did they do? They went stark raving mad. All right, when, when they have a, a stoning party and everybody starts picking up rocks and nobody organized it, it just started happening. Pretty serious. But Jesus, well, because it's not his time, what does he do? He breaks out. Now, I don't know what that looks like. 
Did he just vanish? Did he get up and float away? I don't know. The fact is, though, he sent them into a rage, and all the more they pursued him. Now, we're going to go through that bit by bit, detail by detail, and I'm going to ask the question, again, that I've asked before, and I'm going to ask again, what do we do with the Christ? Are we going to receive him as he proclaims himself to be? Am I going to hold to him like he would call us to? Or am I going to respond like the liberal theologian and be like, yeah, that doesn't seem very loving. No, that doesn't seem very kind. I, I just, I'm just not so sure about this. Or are we going to take him at his word? Because if I take him at his word, the cost of that discipleship is great. The cost of that discipleship is more than just some mere profession of faith, but it is an actual following of the Master and King. If I'm going to take Him to be who He is, I'm either going to pick up stones to throw at Him, or I'm going to bow and worship Him. So let that sit in our minds as we go through. Jesus speaks. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is a promise that he's been giving all the way through John again and again and again. All right? I am the light. I come into the darkness. And you're not going to be walking in darkness if you have this light. Right? You will have the light of life. You want life? It is going to be found in Jesus Christ. So the Pharisees, he, Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Right? As if you, know, you can't speak testimony or, or truth about yourself, you've got to have somebody else say it. Well, in a manner of speaking, if I'm sitting there being like, you know what, I am the most amazing pastor you've ever seen. How many of you are going to believe me? You're going to be like, man, thank you, Seth. I love you, brother. <laughs> yeah, most of you would be like, man, that dude really likes himself. Right? However, if somebody is like, hey, that guy's a good pastor. You're more prone to believe him, right? And that's all they're pointing to. And so here he's sitting here saying, yep, I'm the light of the world. And they're like, meh, I don't think so. Jesus responds, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. All right? So multiple times to this similar group of people, he's claimed to be from where? From above, from heaven. I come from the Father. The Father sent me down. And he insults them implicitly by the fact that you don't know where, I'm, where I've come from. You don't know even where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. That is the human tendency. This is the criticism he brings. And he says, I'm not judging anyone. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, because he's gonna, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. So the same phrase as he said over and over again, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are together. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And so his claim to being affirmed by God in the middle of this is distinctly offensive to them as a people they said to him there they said to him therefore where is your father jesus answered you know neither me nor my father if you knew me you would know my father also and what is their response to him he keeps claiming that same thing over and over again i am one with the father you don't know him you don't know him you don't know him well he's sitting in a place called the treasury he's sitting in the temple He's teaching, and what can nobody do in response? Nobody can arrest him. And it's not because they're not able to arrest somebody, but they are just so taken back by the manner of presentation which he has been giving day after day. They are so taken back by the authority with which he speaks, and many of them are contemplating the realities of what he is saying. Here is the light of the world. Is he? Is he that? He continues on. Verse 21, he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. In what way are they seeking? In what way are they seeking Christ? 
Well, I think it's the way many people see Christ. They, they seek Him as a matter of intrigue. How many people have you seen interested in Christ because of the crazy things that are claimed about Him? I mean, come on. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Being born of a virgin. Right? Raising from the dead. Right? The God-man. All these are pretty magnificent claims. And so there's got to be a measure of intrigue that anybody, even the unbeliever, might find in, in him. And so there's going to be a manner that they seek him, but they're not going to find him. So the Jew said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I'm from above. And here's where the attacks come, all right? Now, it's not really an attack. It's just pointing out the reality of where they're from. You're from below. I'm from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sin, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, unless you believe that I am he, unless you believe that the Father sent me, unless you believe that I am the Christ, unless you believe that I am the Messiah, unless you believe that I am the one who has come to redeem mankind, you will perish. We don't like to say that. The modern liberal theologian does not like to say that. That's so judgmental. I'm sorry, my friends. The gospel is a matter of judgment against people. As much as it is good news, it's also a judgment upon people and their need. You need a Savior. You need Jesus. Or you're going to die in your sin. This is what Jesus says to them. This is how he presents it to them. And so they're like, who are you? They don't quite get it. Who are you? They're still struggling. It's just as I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have been sent from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, Jesus grasped what they were misunderstanding, and so what did he do? Let's clarify. Let me help you understand. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, which again, the Son of Man is a phrase that is used from the book of Daniel that the Jewish ear would have known as a claim to deity, as a claim to the one that God would be sending. Then you will know that I am He, and that I did nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. In other words, I am the obedient one. Jesus stands there and says, I am the one that has done the things that have pleased the Father. And what has been the reputation of the Jewish people and the whole of humanity to this point? Not doing the will of the Father. Not pleasing God. Can anyone in this room say that everything I've ever done pleases God? If you do say that, come talk to me. I'll disabuse you of that really quick, right? It doesn't take long for the humanness and the worldliness of a person to demonstrate itself, especially around me, because I'm annoying, right? I can itch that sin bug real quick. The fact is, Jesus claims this perfection, this position of superiority. And what happens? Many believed. Many believed, many responded by seeing what he is doing and seeing the comparison between the religious leaders and himself and hearing his argument, hearing what he is saying, hearing his presentation to the truth. And so he continues in response to the many believing. Verse 30, Jesus said to the Jew who had believed him, Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word. Christian, why do you think I make such a big deal about reading God's word? Because how else am I to abide in it and remain in it unless I'm reading it? Unless I'm constantly consuming it? Because I tell you, the human mind has a way of playing tricks on you. It has a way of changing over time. Your perception of reality can be altered depending upon maybe what you ate for dinner that night or how well you've been sleeping. It can be altered just over a course of time. I remember my dad telling me a story about deer hunting once where we were deer hunting and I did something. I was like, I would never do that. Mainly because I didn't remember doing it. 
And then everybody around me is like, oh, no, that sounds just like you. And we have experiences like that. You have experiences like that. You remember something some way, and, and maybe your husband or your wife or your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad remembers it differently. It's like that commercial where you have instant replay, right? You've seen the commercials where they have instant replay where, you know, it's like, I would have never forgotten the cooler or the, you know, the kayak or whatever, and the gal's like, oh, yeah, she throws the red flag, you know, and she's like, oh, the best part of that was, when you're like, oh, no, no, I'll put that in there. He's like, who talks like that, right? Everybody's seen the commercial. It'd be great to have instant replay to see what actually happened at time. But the fact is, is our human fallible brain doesn't always remember. And one of the ways that we can remember is to remain or abide or stay under or to endure the reality of the word. Now, the word doesn't like to be translated as endure. But in some ways, there is an endurance, like in the sermon, right? You're like, how much longer? He's only on point three. Yes, there are two more points, and they're longer, right? It endure under the word, endure in reading. Like, like how many of you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you feel like is Christian? I don't. That's the angriest part of the day for me. Why? Because i got to get out of bed, Right? And I'm angry that it hurts so bad. Why do my knees hurt so bad when they hit the floor? And why is it so cold in this house? And why is the toilet so far away? We should put one on the corner over here next time. And you're immediately, I don't know, you might be, you might be a better Christian than me. I'm just saying. But like, I have to wake up and pray and read like to get myself to a baseline of like acceptable to the other humans in this world of just being kind. I have to abide, I have to remain, I have to endure underneath that tutelage, that being transformed by the renewal of my mind and not conformed to this world. To be able to rejoice in the truth that will set me free. They answered in response to him, because they, you know, they don't really like this remaining under his word nonsense. Verse 33, they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Now, this is worth a dissertation, by the way. We could spend the next six hours on that passage alone. First off, yes, they have been enslaved, right? Secondly, instead of like, yeah, we should abide under the word of God, they're like, yeah, we're children of Abraham. I mean, there is a religious lineage that they just claimed, and Jesus is about to shred them with it. In their pride, they're like, we're not enslaved to anything. I'm good. I'm good, man. Have you checked who, my, my history? Very similar to people today being like, yeah, I come from a preacher's house. I'm a PK, baby. Right? I was in church nine months before I was born. I know the word of God like the back of my hand. Sorry, PKs in the room. There's a handful of them. <laughs> There's a particular arrogance that we might feel for certain reasons within our life whether it's a PK or whether it's just a person that's been going to church every day since 1974, ain't missed a single day of Bible reading, and, I, and I'm always here. We might have reasons just like this. No, 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 we're children of Abraham. We are not enslaved. Jesus goes, well, I think differently. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. How many of you sinned this morning? I want to see hands, by the way. I want to be... Yeah, everybody. I'm sorry. I just Everybody sinned. We all sinned. We're all a bunch of sinners. Anybody who practices sin is still enslaved to sin, and there's a freedom that comes in Christ. So how many of you like planned on sinning this morning and were like, yeah, I really enjoyed it? Hopefully nobody. Hopefully people are relatively repentant and and you know recognize who they are and what they've done or what they do and trust in the lord anybody who practices sin is a slave to sin and the slave does not remain in the house forever the son remains forever in other words you're not going to receive the mercy and grace of god the general mercy and grace of god that's expressed to the whole of humanity you're not going to receive that forever the Son of Man does. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Free from what? Free from slavery to sin. 
I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Oh, the burn in coming. Who is their father? Well, they kind of boast back. And they're like, yeah, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what a the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. Abraham's not your father. If you would have done the works that he did, you would believe me in what I'm saying. You have another father. In comes the insult. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. The whole virgin birth thing that I was referring to, yeah, they, they don't believe it. It had to have been sexual immorality that happened there. We have one father, even God. So they just bypassed it. They're like, no, no. The Father is our God. Our God is the Father. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you will... And your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear from them is that you are not of God. He slathers it on pretty harsh, right? Not very loving, Jesus. You can't tell people that. Uh, the Son of God just did. He just did. He absolutely just told them, hey, you, you are not who you think you are. You are not who you claim to be. Be careful. Taking a step back, this is one of the reasons why I make such an emphasis in our congregation of us knowing the Word and us knowing Christ and us understanding who He is and what He has said and shaping our lives around it and what He has said to us rather than religious presumptions, traditions that we have grown up in or others have grown up in. This is why I press us to understand this because what happens what happens if somebody leads you astray? Think about it. What if, what if Johnson leads you astray? Can you trust me as a human being enough to lead you in the right path? Well, yeah, I think you're good. Look at your face. It's a kind face. Don't trust me. I'm not saying that I'm going to turn around and start preaching heresy tomorrow, but the fact is, is mankind has demonstrated the inability to finish well in many situations. Trust the Lord and trust His Word. Hold me accountable to it. This is why I labor like I do through it because I don't want to be found being the one that has taken people and led them to a pit. It would be better for a millstone to be tied around my neck and have me thrown in the river. We together gather in the name of Jesus Christ and together we have the great benefit of opening His Word with one another to see who He is, to see who we are, to see what He requires, to see how He would call us to walk, to see what He says that we might abide in it together. May we abide in His Word together. May we not be like those Pharisees. May we not be like the liberal theologian that smatters the bookshelves of our day and age. Constantly, passively, unlovingly, with a veneer of love, calls into question God and the things of God. Doing the very thing that they do right here. Doing the very thing that the Pharisee did to Jesus. And Jesus wasn't having it. He doubles down. They think they've got Him. The Jews answered, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They are just reaching here. Oh yeah, well you're... 
stupid and possessed. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's like arguing with a 14-year-old, right? I'm serious. This is the level of argumentation that they're bringing here. 14-year-olds, I'm sorry, right? All the 14-year-olds in the room, I love you guys. However, you are you like this. You are a Samaritan and have a demon. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And isn't that just like the human spirit? He has been speaking in metaphoric terms this entire time. He's been speaking in spiritual realities this entire time. And they're just like, ha ha, gotcha. And he's like, I'm not sure that's what he sounded like. Too much. But it's pretty close. Are you greater than our father? Abraham, are you greater than the prophets? They all died. Who do you make, make yourself to be? Jesus says, if I glory myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do know him, do not know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jew said, you are not yet 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now again, that might fall flat on our ears today, but just implant yourself into the book of Exodus. Read about the burning bush. What happened? The presence of God showed up in a bush that was burning yet not consumed, and he gave Moses command for how he was going to be a redeemer of sorts for his people and set them free from their slavery. And the great I Am led that campaign as the one who led the redeeming force that Moses was. And the reality is, is that was a direct claim to being God, being the one who was there in the beginning, being the one who was before all things and who through all things are created. What is their response? Pick up your pitchforks and torches. We're going to get them, boys. They grab rocks. This is the Jewish version of that. They grab rocks, and they go to stone him, and Jesus takes off. This very often is the response that people have to the true Jesus when you press the issue. We like the idea of a saving Jesus. We like the idea of a comfortable, easy Jesus. We don't like the idea of the controversial Jesus. We don't like the idea of the Jesus who claims to be one with the Father. We don't like the idea of the Jesus who claims to be eternally preexistent, who claims to be superior, supreme, preeminent. We don't like those big words. And yet that is an inextricable component of who he is. The one in whom all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. Jesus. The liberals get uncomfortable with that. One of the ways that they get uncomfortable with that is they're like, oh, Pastor, people are not theologians. You can't be using those complex words. That's just too much. You're going to lose people. People are going to leave and be like, I've got to bring a dictionary to go to church. Well, maybe. And that's okay. Is your eternity not worth a little bit of mental effort now to figure out the extraneous long words that Johnson used up front? Yes! Yes, it is! Believe it or not, I'm not a bookish guy, and yet books have become important to me. Why? Because in them I can learn, I can grow, and most importantly, the book has become important to me that I labor in day in and day out that I might abide and remain in His Word, that I might benefit from it and that you might benefit the same. By God's grace, may our response to Christ not be a response 
uh, of just nominal acceptance? May it not just be a response uh, of pharisaical acceptance? May, may it be a response in which we're like Peter? You have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? What else do we have? We got you. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, there are hard things to understand. We have nowhere else to go. We have life and nothing else. Christian, may we respond like that to Christ and his word. May we abide in it. May we remain in it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your goodness. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for those that seek with me to remain and abide in the word of God. And I pray this morning as we've gathered in your name and we've gone through this argument that Jesus has had with the Pharisees that we may not find ourselves to be Pharisees. Oh, how easy it is to slide into Pharisaical liberalism. It's so much more comfortable, so it seems. May we be found faithful, those who abide in the Word and the Word of God, that abide and remain in Jesus, our Savior and King. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for our Savior. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.